Hey guys, this is DFD, aka Dark Frozen Deaths, back with another Kamihime Project video. This one I'm going to do a little bit differently because I'm not going over the event itself because the event is like a really pathetically easy type of um, crossover event. And some of the enemies are even Phantom type too, so for the most part you can use whatever element you want and still get weakness in there. The boss is light, but uh, you don't necessarily have to use dark. It's like, you'll, you'll be able to deal weakness damage in the event, but you won't take it. Plus, crossovers are generally easier than um, normal advents, so I kind of don't feel like I need to go over the event itself. But there are other things I need to cover, starting off with the characters, because there's currently two crossover characters that's in there right now. One of them has a rate up, and then the other one will get a rate up, so you can focus specifically on which one you want. I'm not trying for the dark one, but she is good. The fire one definitely is a highlight of um, the banner, though. But um, I'll start off by going over what they do. So, first off, they have this little mechanic where they get a special type of um, icon on themselves called a heat gauge. This is basically a buff that stacks itself, or you should say a debuff in this case, where if it hits a certain point, they no longer can use abilities until it's removed. This isn't going to be the only time this is in a game. There's going to be some Kamihime that do it later down the line. But every five turns is when the heat gauge is completely removed. And when it hits 10 stacks, you can't use any abilities whatsoever. Now, the other similarity that they both happen to have, whenever you burst with them, it decreases the cost the heat cost for each ability by one and it stacks two times so you can reduce the heat cost by two so if something had a heat cost of four it goes down to two that's generally what you're going for now then into the dark one she's more defensive so if you do have somebody like say Pluto you're still pretty much good for dark you don't necessarily have to go after her but this character is still very good for um a few other purposes too, so it's not bad if you want to grab her. Now, first ability. And a lot of these abilities have very low cooldown, but they also usually have low duration to go with it. Now, first ability, she can basically use it every turn as long as she maintains heat gauge. She will put counterattacks on herself. Meaning, whenever she gets smacked, she's going to strike back. And then on top of that, too, she will also increase the, the um, chances of her being targeted. That's what the attention buff is. This kind of has some decent uses in, like, different types of stuff, like raids and all that, too. And I'll cover a little bit more about raids later. But, um, like, for instance, if you're, you're fighting, say, Hagif and, um... You want to try and deal with the little 50% trigger, you can draw attention to herself and now we'll let her be the one getting targeted by all that stuff. Something like that. But, um, it has its, it has some uses, but not entirely. It all depends on the situation. But, um, it increases her heat gauge by 3, so if you burst twice with her, it can be by 1, and you can generally have, like, full uptime on this, if you want. Now, her second ability... No cooldown. However, it only lasts for the turn that she uses it. And the reason being for that is that it's a, it's a stackable damage cut. Increases her heat gauge by 4, so you can honestly get it to 75% out the gate. But when you start reducing the, um, the heat gauge, she can get up to 125%. Now, the reason I mentioned 125% is because the malicious raids, your damage cut is half effective. So... That 125 is going to be somewhere around, like, I'd say 63%. So you get a, still a very sizable cut for something like, a, say, a white malicious. If you need to, like, deal with, say, the transition between blue gear to red gear. But, um, the key thing about this is the fact that it's a stackable cut. So, um, it will stack with anybody else's cut, even her own. That makes it very, very valuable to actually have. And then it's got a heat gauge of 4 but, again, when you burst twice with her, it can get reduced to 2. So, she can effectively get, like, 125% if done right. Now, the third one is more of, like, a support type of thing for damage. It increases the chances of, um, dealing stinger damage. It translates a sneak attack for some reason for, um, 
Japanese side, but it's Stinger. The problem with this is that it has a heat gauge of 6 normally, so you only get to use it twice. And it can get reduced to 4. It doesn't seem to stack from what I can tell, and it lasts for 3 turns, but it's got a cooldown of 5. So you're not going to have it up all the time. Now, I don't know if the usage interval shrinks or not. I'm going to double check that a little bit later, but um, considering that you get a Stinger buff, it's not too bad, actually, because Stinger is another multiplier. It still has a chance of going off, but combined with stuff like Vigor, if you have it, or Rebellion, some people happen to pull a Rebellion Hime, or your Assault, your Elemental, stuff like that, Stinger can actually be pretty useful. I'm using Stinger because I have no Vigor on my Dark Grid, but um, it does indeed help you out, trust me on that one. Now, the other um, passive is basically to increase the defense of... Um, that ally with the lowest HP, and it just keeps stacking, pair point blank. It never wears off, as far as I know, but it, it's only single target, so keep that in mind. But, going into all the different stuff for all these things, it says that, um, it says that the effect that you get for the Stinger buff is actually somewhere up to 60 or 70%. That is absurdly strong, so keep that in mind. It is a very big size increase for um, Stinger, so keep that in mind. If you have um, if you happen to have a uh, say nine heat gauge, that's a, probably a good time to use the Stinger buff just to sip and um, get the most expensive one, because it doesn't matter how far you go over ten. All that matters is if you hit ten or more. Because when you hit 10 or more, you can't use any more abilities until that's re removed. So, definitely try to time this out because whenever it ha ha happens to activate, it's going to be a very, very sizable boost. So, keep that in mind about our third ability. And as far as it goes to pa the um, passive assist, it doesn't, it doesn't go away. However, it is 5% per stack. So... As the battle draws out, you can actually get more and more defensive, and it can help help you out on that one. The only exception is stuff like White Malicious, where it's like, it'll deal fixed damage after the turn. You can't do anything about that, so no defense or cut's going to help you there. But it does help you survive the fights a little bit longer, so she's definitely one of those type of characters where it's like, as the fight draws out, she just gets better. So keep that in mind. But the Stinger buff is definitely a very, very noteworthy thing. It's... A buff that gives you 60 or 70% in a, for all allies, that explains why it has such a high um, heat gauge. But yeah, that is very, very powerful, and it's definitely worth it if you have her. However, the one that I say has more priority is the Fire One, who doesn't have a rate up currently, but she will pretty soon. But she is indeed with, in the gotcha with the Dark One, so even though the Dark One has a rate up right now, you can still pull the Fire One. Some people already have. But, um... Generally, with the Fire um, one from Baldur's Sky, she's more offensive-based. Same thing as before, she has a heat gauge mechanic. It decreases by 2 if you um, burst twice, and that's the limit for that. She also has an ability where the duration increases as she bursts as well. I mean, as she um, lands her special type of debuff. The special debuff in question is her second ability, where it is it has no cooldown whatsoever, and it lasts forever. Like, I, if I remember correctly, until um, buffs get cleared or something like that, I think it, that's the only time it will get erased. But what it does is give you one stack of normal attack resistance down. One stack of it. And you can stack it up to three times for a total of 30%. How that works is that if you have, say, 50% defense down, the normal attack resistance will push it up to 70%. So you really only need 40% for that in order to get full effect. But um, that's the only time you can bypass 50% for defense down, but it's only towards normal attack damage. What makes her stand out is the fact that it is still effectively permanent when you look at it this way. So if you do happen to have the fire version of Thanatos... 
she would probably take her place. Like this um, character right here. Because permanent normal attack damage increase is very, very good. That said, though, too, she also has things to help her um, normal attack damage as well. Where her performance can go up. It starts off at one turn, but I know if you um, stack the armor destruction, it can go up to five turns. So she can have permanent uptime on that. And it has a heat gauge of three, so it'll reduce to one while it's also getting a better duration. She can have permanent uptime on this, essentially. The other thing she has is um, giving herself a follow-up hit, which actually has a pretty good damage good amount of damage for it to um, follow up. She can keep it up with permanent uptime done correctly, but the thing is, it has a heat gauge of 6, so you definitely want to get it reduced a little bit at some point. Since you're mainly normal attack focused, that's the whole thing. It's going to um greatly help you out with the follow up and the normal attack resistance and all that. That, that said to her combo rate is going to increase the more she gets that armor destruction. That second ability is her her bread and butter for this entire kit. It is basically stacking that up, and then her other abilities just get better as you go along. Now, when you do max out that armor destruction, it doesn't make ability too useless, because it still does fire, fire damage to an enemy, but it activates twice when it's at maximum, so it's a se essentially a double cast. And you can keep firing it off as long as you have heat gauge remaining too, so you can... If you really want to, get her heat gauge re reduced, like her heat gauge cost to reduce so much to where you can fire it off like five times in a turn. But since it double casts, it's effectively doing ten nukes in a turn, ten ability nukes. So she's kind of got some use for an elaborate comp composition too. Slight use, but nothing too noteworthy like the other ones. But again, she's a very, very good character and. Currently, right now on the Japanese side, I do believe she is, in fact, part of the normal attack meta, if you happen to have her. But because she's a crossover character, you may or may not have her. So, my suggestion, if you're going to pull on this banner, get the fire one. Definitely get the fire one. Like, wait for her raid up, or wait for her pity, or whatever, and go for the fire one. The dark one is good, too. Don't get me wrong. She's very good. In fact, my opinion, she's better than the defensive Hemi we have for dark. But the dark one is less priority than fire. That's just my opinion. But we are not done yet because I still have to go through this special specific thing for um what's happened in game. And also there's a free character too. Um I'm not really gonna go over her in this one, unfortunately, because since everybody's gonna get her, you can just go you can just go over what she does on your own. But um as far as I know, her kit's like the usual stuff for SR, it's decent, but at the same time, you still need to, um, you still would only use her in something like Tower. So, there's that. But, um, they got some stuff here, some gacha campaigns and all that. It's two specific things I absolutely have to cover. When you do the Baldur's Guy collaboration, do it, make sure to clear your mission for every day. It is... A 10 chain gotcha ticket, meaning you get 10 pulls daily just for doing that. On top of this, you also get an SSR guaranteed. The SSR guaranteed does not repeat, but again, it's there. Make sure you're doing your missions every single day in order to get that 10 pull, the free 10 pulls. Also, they gave you like 3,000 magic jewels. Japanese side got that too, so anybody that wants to pull on a banner they actually has a shot, but like I said, Focus more on the fire one than the um, dark one. You can still get the dark character from the fire banner. Keep that in mind. But um, definitely focus on the fire one more, in my opinion. But um, I have to go over this maintenance notice right here. Like, this one is definitely the biggest part of this video. Now, they've done quite a bit of changes. And I have to go over that. Now, when it comes to the standard and expert, they give you three times the drop rate on stuff. That doesn't increase the drop rate on the red metal, so they're still the same as before. But you only can host it one time. 
it makes it a lot faster to grind your standard and expert now, so keep that in mind. You can just tap it once and be done. Now, they also adjusted the HP of um, some of the enemies in the raids, too. So, keep that in mind. I do believe some of them have been changed in the, um, in the standard and the expert. Some of them have been changed in the... Um, I think the Ragnarok and the Guardians have had it changed before they reduced it by a certain percentage. So, keep that in mind. Um, the big thing is the fact that the overall HP for the Ragnarok fights, Ragnarok raids, and um, the Guardian raids, like the the ones that are labeled Ragnarok for um, Ragnarok Catastrophe and Ragnarok Guardian, all have their HP reduced and their resistance reduced by a lot. Oach is the only exception to this. She's still the same. But with the raids that did get that nerf, Ragnarok raids, Ragnarok Catastrophe, they are one-third of the HP they used to have. Guardians are half the HP they used to have. Makes them a lot easier to kill. On top of this, their resistances to debuffs are greatly reduced. If you're wondering why you can suddenly start debuffing Ophiel or why some of these fights are not lasting as long as they used to, that's why. It is a very huge increase to the grind. So keep that in mind. They also add some quality of life changes where you can get a button in order to um do something where it's like you can go straight to equipment screens and all that type of stuff. A little bit of navigation changes. I'm not going to go too much over that. Another interesting little change that could help you out if you're happening to get the Nikkei medals. They've added more stuff to the shop that you can trade for. So if you're kind of lazy to grind or just that little bit off and don't mind using Nikkei medals for it, there you go. You got some more flexibility and more freedom with that one. And the only other thing I can mention, too, is that um, when it comes to some of the raid content, I do believe they changed the amount of uh, elixir usage before, if not on this patch. So you can use elixirs however many times you want on a lot of the um, raid content now. So that's a last-ditch effort if you happen to like really want to get the drops, but... Personally, if you're good enough, you're not going to be dying in a raid anyways. Now, it's easier said than done, especially with the malicious raids. They are very, very hard-hitting. But, again, if you're doing things, in my opinion, properly enough, you won't die. The only exceptions I can say is the, the wind and the light malicious. They hit, like, trucks. I can survive the wind malicious because of a specific character. If you don't have the specific character, it's a lot harder. That happens to be Fire Shamash. You need her and Rom in order to sip and basically just face tank all the um, nukes. Light Malicious is a totally different story altogether. You have to try and deal as much damage as you possibly can because that's how you reduce the, the um, follow-up damage you take every turn. If you're not good enough on that one, which most free-to-play players probably won't, then you're just going to end up dying eventually and just hope somebody kills a raid for you. So, those are only two cases where I say you probably could die pretty frequently. Otherwise, I would say it's a case of not grinding enough and not getting strong enough because um, the other fights aren't aren't as hard or aren't as difficult. You just need to make sure you're using the right characters. Even R and S are, are there for that. And make sure your grid's strong enough. Even the Wind Malicious is, is slightly flexible if you know what you're doing. The Light one is all heavily grid-based, though. But worst case, you can use Elixirs and, um, and the Malicious at least once. The other raids, I do believe it's infinite. I forgot to mention that before, but it's something that's definitely in the game by now. But, um, anyways, that's all for this. This was a bit of a long video, and it covered a lot of different stuff, too. And, um, the free weapon they give you for this, the free SR weapon, is not one of those rainbow weapons, so don't even bother keeping it if you're a new player. That's all I'm going to say about that. But, um, anyways, that's all for this. More of this will come soon. I'm hopefully going to get the fire character, because I am trying to focus on fire teams. But, um, if I don't, then oh well. There's always other characters. Fire for not Thanatos is always in the gotcha, if I remember correctly. And you're going to want her for the technical weapons anyways, if you're focused on normal attacks. But, um, anyways, that's all for this. More of this will come soon, and take care.